screen. Anybody can see my screen? I need I need someone who can <laughs> reply to me. Yes, then I, yes. Then I, yes. Yeah, then, then I know that you can. Then I then I know I'm not I'm not speaking to um, sleeping people. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I uh, Dr. Muni invited me. Um, uh, I think uh, last week, a few days ago, that uh, to share something about what to consider in the in the equipment design because you are now in your PDP two in the equipment design and then um, um, and then I said okay uh, just share something so it should be okay um, so the the title of the the, the current sharing session is uh, important points in equipment design um, like Dr. Mune mentioned before I'm not really sure if you know me uh, because I haven't I, I asked around my colleagues and then I they told me that I haven't met any of you or maybe I met some of you I don't know uh, but anyhow, just an introduction. Um, uh, laser pointer. So uh, my name is uh, Zulfa Putra, and then the hours lecturing at UTP uh, from August 2016 until December 2019, and then starting this January, uh, I'm in KLCC Tower Three. Yeah, if you like to see me, if you like to see me, you can just come by in Tower Three, but uh, not at this moment because everybody is working at home now. So, um, um, okay, um, project equipment design. So, if if I if if you see this, uh, because because I, I think at the uh, at this point in time, uh, all of you should have come up with this kind of flow sheet. I, I hear I hear a background noise. Is is that from any one of you? Baby noise or something? Which could you please mute? Oh, okay. Um, so if if uh, I'm 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 pretty sure that you have come across you have your own flow sheet looking like this roughly, right? Uh, and then uh, because um, coming up with this flow sheet should be part of your equipment. Uh, sorry, PDP one, which is which was last semester. Now in, in this semester, uh, you your your uh, what you have to do is then. Um, you go into detail on selecting some of these equipments and then in the meantime you could also then um, um, uh, adjusting or uh, making your flow sheet much much better uh, having having the knowledge you have now yeah after your pdp1 so i just took this uh, example as a flow sheet so that we can just we can we can we can just um, uh, do the sharing session uh, via an example um, Assuming that this is then your flow sheet, and then this is a flow sheet of uh, methanol dehydration to make a DME. So you have a methanol coming in, yeah, it goes to into a storage tank, so to say, and then it's uh, going to be pumped. It is pumped here, uh, and then it is then uh, mixed with the recycled methanol later on, and then they have like um, like a preheater um, using medium pressure steam in this heat exchanger. And then it goes through uh, what we call um, uh, feed effluent heat exchanger because it is using the heat that is coming out of the your reactor. So we normally call it uh, FE -E, feed effluent heat exchanger, um, which you could see this when you do your pinch analysis correctly, your heat integration. Some of you uh, are doing uh, or have done pinch, pinch, pinch analysis or heat integration course, I believe. So um, it gets heated and then it enters the reactor. So in this reactor, that methanol, that methanol um, point uh, pens. So we have two uh, methanol. I'm not very good at drawing. Uh, uh, this makes um, DME uh, plus uh, water. Yeah. So. Um, Um, so the reaction itself is exothermic, as you would know from your, uh, in this case it, it is exothermic, but in your case it could be endothermic as well, or exothermic, I don't know. Uh, so the heat released by the reaction will then be used to preheat the incoming feed. And then it gets cooled down, and then it will then be expanded by this valve to allow a pressure. Um, and then it will then be separated. So if we have methanol, DME, and water, we have uh, DME as the lightest component. So DME will then be coming from the top, uh, condensed, 
completely and then they will then send uh, into DME storage tank in a liquid form. But so, so it's a pressurized uh, line. Yeah? And then the, the bottom part would be uh, the methanol and water, the unreacted methanol gets sent to the second column, it expanded again to the, uh, yeah, from 10 bars roughly, and then it goes to 7 bar. Uh, and then the, the unreacted methanol is then taken out as the liquid distillate, send it back to the, uh, either to the tank or at discharge of the pump. Yeah. And then the, the produced water is sent to wastewater. So if, if you come um, at the beginning of the semester having, having uh, this kind of flow sheets and then the, um, and then the main question comes to mind is then what should we think about in this in this in this regard? What are the important aspects of 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 these equipments uh, that I have to uh, consider when I am going to design um, uh, all of this uh, equipment? So I'm, I'm um, yeah the the I would say that the disadvantage of having a webinar is it's it's uh, it's less it's less interactive or it's not interactive. <laughs> Uh, so um, let's just say, yeah. So now we have a methanol coming in. So what we have to think about is um, uh, number one: what is then the capacity of this methanol? Um, you should have uh, known this. It is uh, part of your uh, uh, requirement. So we know, uh, based on our mass balance, we know that uh, we have a certain amount of uh, methanol fluoride. It comes with its uh, impurities, and then it is stored in the storage tank. Now comes to the question, what is then uh, the size of the storage tank? And then you could say, okay, um, if, uh, if I have a certain amount of metal, say for example, one ton an hour, and then um, I always have, for example, this plant, which I'm now thinking, it is going to be located in an existing, for example, yeah, in an existing petrochemical complex where they have a rail car, for example. Or if they don't have a rail car, so my methanol will come from uh, from a truck, for example. So this truck, it will come for every day. It will come every day. Yeah, with this, I don't know, maybe a 50, 60 meter cube per truck. And then the, it will come only in the work, working days. It will not come during the weekend because you also don't work during the weekend, only the operator do. So you say, okay, so the truck drivers, they don't come during the weekend. So that means um, uh, if it comes from Monday until Friday, that means you have enough, um, uh, you have a continuous supply from the truck into your, uh, into this tank. Yeah, but how about man, uh, Friday and, uh, sorry, how about Saturday and Sunday while the plant is still running, but you still have to have some methanol left here. So that means in this case, you could have, uh, you could argue that, well, um, in order for that Sunday, uh, sorry, Saturday and Sunday for the plant to be still up and running, I need to have enough methanol in this tank. Right. So then you could say, OK, so maybe I need to have like a Saturday, Sunday and then maybe another one day. So three days of residence time uh, of this methanol. So then you can calculate. So you have one ton an hour of methanol times 24 times three days. That should then be the capacity of your storage tank roughly as your first indication. Yeah. So that solves your um, yeah methanol tank uh, sizing. Then you, you know the density. Yeah, you know the density, and then if you if you um, uh, design this at atmospheric pressure, which we normally do, and then you know you can calculate the volume, and then if you have the L over the ratio for atmospheric tank, for example, one or one point one, one point two, then you can calculate the diameter and the height. So that solves this problem. Okay, and then next it has to go to this pump. So we have to pump this methanol at atmospheric pressure. Uh, the question comes then: uh, to how much extent do I have to pump this? Right. So do I have to pump it to go through this heat exchanger or to that heat exchanger or to this reactor or all the way until this distillation column? So you see this distillation column is about 10 bar. Yeah, the, this uh, part is 10 bar, this trapezium is 10 bar, and then this column is 7 bar. So I may not need, I mean, I need to... Hmm. Um, is the connection lost or no? No, no sir, we no. can okay. so, uh, you. Yeah. yeah, so, um, um, where was I? 
<laughs> this pressure. Okay, so uh, you see this pressure 7.3, 10.3. That means you will not design this pump uh, to pump it at 7.3. You must have designed it to overcome a much higher pressure. Is it then the 10.3? Or could it be higher? In this case, uh, you have to look into what are, you have to prepare yourself, uh, you have to make a list of what are the required operating conditions of each equipment. Uh, for example, you start with this tank, so uh, how is this ethanol is going to be stored? Yeah, uh, To get the answer of this question, you have to go to the MSDS of methanol. There, they have some uh, information, they have, inf not some, they have the uh, accurate information of how methanol should be stored, how DME should be stored, how water should be stored, or how any other chemicals should be stored. Yeah, based on that information, you design or handle your storage tank of methanol and a storage tank of your any other intermediate products or uh, end products. And then the, comes to the uh, uh, reactors and distillation columns or separation unit. So this reactor it must have some uh, acceptable um, operating range. Okay, it must have a acceptable operating range in the, in the sense that um, uh, below that operating range, um, you the the reaction will not happen, and then above that operating range, uh, something bad is going to happen. Like for example, the composition reaction, or the um, uh, like uh, the the runway reactions. So the reaction goes very violent, or any other stuff. Um, in this case, in this particular case, the methanol uh, in this DME reaction, it it runs at uh, 250 degrees C, uh, and then the, for example, yeah, it runs at 250 degrees C, and then it um, it runs at the like 15 bar. So this equipment has the highest pressure compared uh, to this uh, vessel, um, this this two distillation columns. So in this case use pump has to be designed in such a way that it can overcome this pressure drop, the first exchanger pressure drop, uh, the second exchanger pressure drop, this flow meter, because this looks to me like an orifice, but it's something that you have to design yourself. Uh, so we have one, two, three, uh, four plus the line pressure drop, yeah, depending on your line size that you would uh, select later on. And then, um, so this four pressure drop values and then plus this 15. So example, for example, you have this pressure drop is like a half a bar. It's like a half a bar just to get a typical number. And it's a half a bar. And then line, okay, you can allow uh, like a half a bar pressure drop. So you have half a bar for the line, another half a bar for this uh, flow meter, it means one bar. Half a bar here, one and a half, half a bar there, it's two bar. And this is uh, 15 bar. So the discharge pressure here should be 15 plus two bars which is um, 17 bar, right? So now you know, okay, now I get the sense of how much is then the discharge pressure. And then the, um, you have already the flow rate required, yeah? So it's done. So now you know, you know then now um, uh, how much is then the, the energy that you like to get out of your pump and then adding to it some, ineffic some efficiency loss and then you get your uh, motor power. So that's for the pump. And then now this um, uh, heat exchanger, the first heat exchanger. Um, there is one major flaw here. If you look at the heat exchanger, there's one major flaw of this flow sheet. Uh, that major flaw is that uh, if you start, if you, if you come to the plant and this plant was like a standing still, uh, no one is running it. So you want to start up the plant. And then when we do so, uh, uh, we pump the methanol, it goes to this uh, line and then the, it will be heated by this medium pressure steam and it goes to this heat exchanger. But since this is a startup, uh, there is no such a product. Um, there is no such a product, um, how do you call it, um, uh, 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 line. So uh, there is no product, so there is no additional energy. So that means um, the main energy supplied to this line is only via this heat exchanger. What happens if this fail means what happens if this is not uh, not suitable, not enough? Yeah, so that means they have to have normally they have to have this another another like uh, a main preheater upstream of the reactor to overcome this issue 
at least this startup issue. So when startup, this is not running. So we have another heat exchanger over here uh, or heater or whatnot. And then to get uh, the fit into the um, uh, operating conditions of the reactor. And then we have the product and then uh, it will then heat it up the incoming fit. Yeah, so that means uh, this heater over here, this imaginary heater over there, you can then reduce the reduce the duty in such a way that at the end you don't need it anymore. You switch it off and then you can just um, being heated up by the um, the output stream of the uh, reactor. That's one case. Now another case is that um, instead of having this as an additional heater, well, you could just better put this heat exchanger there. So in that sense, you don't have to invest into uh, with um, another heat exchanger. So whatever your reason is, it has to be backed up with your data, with your simulation data. Yeah. So this is just an example to get you thinking. Um, so now assume, assume, yeah, assume now this heat exchanger is strong enough. Means it uh, we need because we uh, we don't want to have additional heater over here, and we don't want to put it there here. Due to whatever reason, yeah, you can just think of any kind of stupid reasons. So, um, so I just want to put it there simply because I like it there. It, it comforts my eyes or whatnot. So you say, okay. So in this case, if you say so, um, that means um, this heat exchanger, it has to be designed in such a way that when this heat exchanger is not running, you can increase the temperature from this stream number three and this stream number four and five. This temperature is already within the operating range of the reactor. You know, the reaction okay so even though later on when this is up and running you may um, uh, close the valve a little bit for this steam so that it will then run like i don't know maybe 50 percent or 60 percent of its design duty that's that's that's, that's okay, okay okay so now with that consideration in mind you can then design this um, uh, um, heat exchanger yeah so that means you want to increase the temperature uh, from room temperature, for example, to 250 degrees C. And then you uh, go to steam table, see um, what is then the pressure of the steam that can condense above 250 degrees C. Yeah, you can find it there. Um, right, it is a, a very high pressure, so you can you can just uh, find it there. Or if you can't, if you cannot find any heating medium, for example, uh, if you go to the steam table and then somehow, in some cases, uh, in some cases maybe somehow you don't see any uh, at steam at that high pressure that can condense at a temperature higher than the temperature it would like to have. For example, uh, this 250 degrees C. Yeah, you want to increase the temperature to 250 degrees C, and then you cannot find any steam that can condense like 260 degrees C or 270 degrees C, for example. So in that sense, you could then, okay, I cannot find uh, any steam uh, that can condense at that high pressure. So I can just use whatever steam pressure that I have over here. And then I have to add a fire heater over here. So that's that's another way as well. Yeah. But uh, all of these arguments, you have to have it. You have to write it down in your notebook. So when it come, when questions come, like, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, if your supervisor comes and asking you these questions, why do you have this and that over there? And then you can answer them, and then you can show them these arguments. Okay. Um, um, well, in the meantime, you can just type in your questions here. Um, so we are settled with this. You know uh, what to do, yeah. Um, and then the, when you come back here, and then you can then the, um, you want to design this. So in this case, you know from your adiabatic temperature rise calculation. So in this reactor. Uh, since you want to, uh, since this reaction, yeah, this particular reaction is exothermic, it releases heat, and then you would like to conserve this heat. Yeah, you don't want it to go waste into the atmosphere, so you would like to run this reactor adiabatically. Yeah, uh, it means you conserve the, uh, the 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 heat. But in that sense, you have to make sure we have to make sure that this adiabatic temperature rise, yeah, because it, it we 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 contain the heat. That means the temperature the temperature here will increase. So say for example, we have 250 over here, and then once it gets this, uh, when it is reacting, uh, touching this catalyst bed, the temperature will increase to 60, to 70, to 80, 300, maybe 350 over here. I don't know, depending on uh, 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 the 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 heat capacity of your stream, and then the, how much heat is then released from that reaction, and how much conversions you will allow for that reaction to happen. Yeah, so three things: um, uh, the heat capacity of the of the feed 
uh, how much heat is being released uh, per, per mole of the product, for example, and how much product that you allow, yeah, you allow, that's the keyword, to be produced in that reactor. And um, if, for example, it goes to like 350 degrees C here, if you calculate that, and then within this 350, from 250 inlet to 350 as the maximum adiabatic temperature rise that you can calculate, uh, if you if you see in the MSDS or in any um, in this data bank, for example, you can see there is no um, um, decomposition of this water DME methanol. If they don't compose, means they are stable enough within that reaction, and there is no recorded side reactions within this 250 and 350 uh, temperature range, for example. Um, then you can. Um, um, you can safely say, okay, I would like just to have it 350 over here. It's safe for me. Yeah, I just I just put here. Um, no, I have a pen. Um, 250 degrees C, and then say this is then 350 degrees C, and you have to calculate here your adiabatic temperature rise. Um, so it gets here, and you know that this 350, and then you are entering, for example, uh, you would like to have 250 over here, right? This is number five, 250 over here, and then this is 350, and then say, for example, okay, I would like to design, yeah. Um, uh, this is based on your pinch analysis study, yeah. So in the first case, in the first case, you don't design this heat exchanger as the as the uh, as a as an integrated part. So you design another one heat exchanger here and another heat exchanger over there, yeah. Or you design one heat exchanger for to to get to temperature from 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 ambient over here. You want to go to 250 over there, so you know you can calculate how much is then the whole whole duty, duty. And then and then from your uh, pinch analysis study or your heat integration, then you know okay I need to um, like um, uh, give some energy from here to there. Yeah, you know how much heat that you need to have to be transferred, and then you can design. Then you design this heat exchanger according to that uh, Q from your heat integration. Yeah, from your integration study. Um, same procedure applies from here to there. So Q equals to U A delta T L M T D, and then the, um, and then you have your M C P delta T. Um, Okay, and then you go here, and then I don't know what temperature here. Maybe, for example, you use temperature is that 150 degrees C, yeah, based based on this based on this duty that you uh, decide yourself. And then you know uh, that uh, this this um, column is operating at 10 bar, and then the, you may need to cool it down, or you may not need to cool it down. That depends. That depends, yeah, because you're going to need because in this distillation column. You are going to need another heat, another heat here, yeah, another duty. So if you if you take out this duty, if you take out this duty, if this is goes high and this will go high as well, yeah. So that means the more you cool it down here, uh, the more you have to spend over here. And but if you cool it down, I mean if you if you don't cool it down, something may happen. So I don't know, yeah. Something you have to check. So if you uh, something that in this case you can then um, you can then uh, how do you call it in your simulation in your simulation you can then play around here. You can vary this Q, vary, vary this Q in such a way that you need to get a constant uh, constant purity over here. Where's my pen? Yeah, constant purity over here. Purity, and then production, and so this has to be constant. And then the and then you play around you you vary this duty, and then see how much is then your duty in this reboiler, yeah. And then you make a plot, and you make a plot. This is a condenser. I uh, sorry, uh, uh, this cooler, cooler, and then this is then your uh, reboiler duty. And then the, and then you get a plot. For example, the more you the more you the, the, the higher this number, and then the higher this number. So you may get something like a, like a straight line or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. And then and then you can the, yeah you can you can do your own quick calculations. Um. Uh. If I have, if I have because if you increase if you increase the cooler duty over here, that means this is going to be increased, right? The uh, sorry the 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 if the if you increase this cooler duty, and then the area for this cooler will increase as well, and um, this will increase as well. 
Yeah, because you increase this duty. So uh, they could be a trade-off or they, there is no trade-off. It's uh, something that you have to check yourself. Yeah. So um, in any case, say that um, you, you, you see that I want like just to cool it down from 150 to uh, 50 degrees C, for example, and then, then you can calculate it accordingly, like what we have done over here and, and there. And then the, um, since this is like um, 15 bar gauge, right? Maybe you allow, this is then 15 bar gauge at the inlet, and then you allow, for example, like a half a bar throughout this reactor. So this is going to be like 14.5 bar gauge. And then you have another half a bar through the valve and half a bar or half a bar through the heat exchanger. So you will lose then, you have then now 14 bar over here. And then you may lose another half a bar over there. Yeah. And then at this point in time, at this point, sorry, at this location, you will have like 13 and a half, 13 and a half bar. So while in here, you need to have 10 bar. So this valve is then used to reduce the pressure from 13 and a half to 10.3. So it's about three bar. You have to you have to let go, three bar. You have to let go of three bar. So you could do you install you can install this uh, valve to reduce the pressure and then to let that energy go out, a wasted useless, or you can then think to yourself, okay, I don't want to uh, waste this energy. So instead of having this valve, I would like to use an expander. So for example, um, pen. Oh, this pen. so you have, um, you have, this is then stream eight, stream eight, or stream eight, and then you have an expander. And then this is then your stream nine. Huh? So this is then 13 and a half, and then this is 10 and a half, 10.3 or 10.5. So this is then you are creating work of like, um, yeah, you can calculate delta PV uh, divided by the efficiency. So you can calculate how much is then the uh, the, the energy that is then being um, produced and which you could sell, yeah, or you could use it internally. That means it will then reduce your operating cost, but you have to um, balance it with the, with the, with investing on the, investing on the, on the expander. Yeah, something that you have to check and then it's good for you to practice and then to consider many options during your design because the the, the goal of this design is then to maximize your um, um, well the goal of design is then number one number one it ideally ideally it's about safety and then number two it's operability ability and number three then it's about money yeah this is the ideality so you need to keep it safe yeah, you don't kill people with your plant, and you have to be able to operate that in um, in uh, yeah in a comfortable manner. It's not that complicated. So any operator graduating from that um, school, they have to be able to operate this plant. Yeah, not complicated enough. And then in the end, it will talk about the money. But in practice, this guy controls the most. Yeah, this money stuff. So in that sense, you have to make sure that you get, you can get, you can squeeze your plan to get as much money as possible, uh, so that in the end you will not get fired, so you can keep your job. Okay. So um, where is my pen? Oh, there's my pen. So now, now comes to the distillation column. So um, um, how do we get this? Yeah. How do we get this pressure and temperature? How do we get that? So how do you get that? You have to come back. Uh, you have to go back to the. Uh, your distillation class because you want to separate this DME yeah you want to separate this DME and then you go to MSDS of the DME what is that at, at which temperature and pressure that you have to that you have to uh, store this DME yeah for example you want to send this DME to L'Oreal you know L'Oreal 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 yeah you know to L'Oreal so they, they use this DME as this um, as um, in their hair spray so that that it can it can spray and then you can use it to yeah to, to spray your hair. So uh, they may have some requirements or uh, and then you need to have also see uh, the MSDS what is then the correct temperature and pressure that you can store your DME in liquid form for example because you want to um, send it by liquid to L'Oreal for example. And then the, um, and then you can see in your uh, 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 VLE VLE, yeah, and then in VLE, um, uh, the look, the shape of the uh, uh, the VLE itself, and then the next question is then the, um, uh, uh, how are you going to condense this? 
how are you going to condense this because you want to condense this fully yeah to be stored how are you going to condense it? are you going to condense it with um, with the cooling water with the cooling water in this case or you want to condense it with the refrigerant refrigerant or you want to condense it with steam yeah and not steam then in this case it's a water and then you want to condense it with water at high pressure so that you can in the end you can make it steam or you can you want to condense it with something else yeah i don't know yeah maybe air cooler is enough but in most cases we condense it in most cases well not we in most cases people condense it with cooling water because it is readily available in any plant and then it's cheap yeah you don't need to pay for this but refrigeration you need to pay for that uh, so um, if say for example you are building this in Kate for example and then the temperature in Kate roughly at 30 35 degrees C I don't know so that means you have a 30 35 degrees C here say 35 degrees C and then um, and then this um, if if this is then 35 degrees C and then you allow this to get uh, to um, to get to uh, 35 sorry from 35 to 40 degrees C for example you allow this to go to 40 degrees C that means this temperature so this temperature, it has to be higher than 40 degrees C. Yeah? And then you go to your VLE, find at which temperature, at which pressure, which pressure that this DME, uh, that this DME can condense, can condense, yeah? Find at which pressure that this DME can condense. So apparently, apparently, if I if I if I condense it uh, if we condense it at 46 degrees C, that the required pressure is 10.3 bar. So that's how you get this pressure. Yeah, that's how you get also this uh, temperature. Um, so you design this based on this pressure and this temperature, and then you would like to design this at um, yeah as low pressure as possible because you would like to yeah to control this right. So you don't want to have uh, at the top you have one VLE and at the bottom you have a different shape of VLE because you have a, a, a much different pressure here okay so for example you would like to design it at like a um, yeah, um, delta P of uh, point, point 0.2 bar so that means this pressure here at the bottom is about point 10.5 bar so um, and then from your um, uh, makeup till diagram or this multi-component um, uh, calculation design then you can design um, uh, the number of stages uh, the minimum reflux ratio, and then um, what is then uh, the stage number? Yeah, is it here, or is it there, or is it here? Okay, and um, so the same principle applies for this column as well. For this column as well. Say now you have like uh, if you have uh, 10.5 bar over here, and then you need to have, for example, 7.3 bar there, and then you need to expand this again. To 7.4 in this case, for example. Um, okay, um, and then you might wonder, okay, well, if I'm cooling it with the same cooling water, um, and then I should, I can then, for example, um, uh, um, um, uh, get a lower pressure than this number in such a way that this line. I can condense it at the same 40, 50 degrees C, right? From 45, for example, from 45 to 50 degrees C, that you would like to condense it because you are going to save to use the same 35 until 40 degrees C of cooling water. So why would I want to, um, why would these people, this guy who wrote this book, uh, why would he want to um, condense it at 7.3 bar and 121 degrees C? So um, I don't know, to be honest. But uh, one way you could think of is that uh, if you condense it, um, if you let it uh, at lower pressure, yes, you could then separate methanol and water much more easier because at lower pressure, the VLE that you have will be uh, thicker. This is at low pressure, but at, at higher pressure, it will be uh, thinner. Yeah? So it will be easier to separate it here uh, than this guy. Uh, so it'll be easier to separate water and methanol. Uh, sorry, water and, and, and yeah, methanol at lower pressure uh, at uh, then compared to the higher pressure. So that's number one. Uh, but uh, you need to look at um, the, the shape of the pressure, the shape of the VLE. How how yeah, how different are they? If if both are if both are like this thick, it's not really a matter. But then the, 
uh, why to at such a higher temperature then i mean the, if both don't matter i would argue just cool it down to to to, to, to room temperature for example but uh, you can see that this line this line they send it back directly to at the discharge of the pump yeah so that means this 121 degree C will help increase this temperature from 25 degree C to somewhere between 25 until 121. So here, instead of coming to the heat exchanger here at 25 degree C, you could come like 50 degree C or 80 degree C, I don't know. So that should save some amount of energy in this uh, medium pressure steam. Okay. But then, okay. And then you think, well, that's a good idea. So why do, why do I go to this low? I could go, I mean, why should I reduce the pressure, right? If the pressure here, I mean, this the shape is as thick as at low pressure and at high pressure, I should just keep it at 10, 10 bar, for example. Why would I want to reduce the uh, pressure to 7 bar? So that's a good question. So in that sense, you have to go back to your uh, heat integration study and see what happens if you if you cool it down, uh, if, you, you, if you have a heat stream, if you have a hot stream, sorry, not heat stream. If you have a hot stream at 121 degrees C, will it help? Will it help to reduce this size and that size and this size? Um, if if you increase this temperature, will it help to reduce this size? And then if the answer is yes, and then you could then maintain the pressure as high as possible. Okay, that is then the, um, something that you have to check. And you go back to your post integration, uh, heat integration study, pinch analysis, and then you come back to your simulations and do all this sensitivity analysis. And then when questions come like this, why do you have to operate that at this pressure, this temperature, you can answer them uh, with these arguments. Um, the same approach for the, um, the distillation column. Um, looking at the time now, it's, 20, oh, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, this is until, until what time? Eh? Until tomorrow morning. 10, 10, sir. Until 10. 10. Okay, 10 you don't want uh, you don't want to go until 11. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, we'll stop at 10. Yeah, no, no worry. Uh, well, I can talk about many, I can talk about this thing for until tomorrow. Um, so we're done with the distillation columns, right? And then the, the way to design the uh, uh, reboiler is just the same with the, with the other exchanger uh, pumps we have done. Um, pumps we have done um, the same 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 situation over here. Um, what else? Eh? Nothing else I would say. Um, as far as what I see here, so if you come up, if you come to me with this kind of flow sheet, these are the things that I would like you to consider, and I would like you to be able to answer. Um, okay. So next slide. So these are the information that you should have before you going to design anything. So like I said, you need to have the um, operating conditions of each of the equipment, pressure, temperature, residence time if you for your reactor, and then the flow ratios if you have um, more than one uh, raw materials, for example, in your reactor. And then you, from your MSDS, from your MSDS uh, of each of the equip, uh, of each of the components. Uh, you know your, you know that the composition reaction, you know the operating limit of your reactor. You need to have the uh, operating limits of the operations and also the safety limit of the operations or of your components. Yeah, this is very important. That is very important. So minimum and maximum operate uh, pressure temperature. So in in your pressure, the temperature. So you have to have like this kind of window. So this is then a minimum. This is then maximum P. Yeah, P min and p max and this is then t min this is then um, t max okay so this is then where you have to work in uh, for equipment yeah for example we have reactor and then distillation column as well um so this is also important to check so important phenomena i think you have you have you have learned right you have learned transfer phenomena so in order for a, 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 a fluid to flow, you need to have a pressure gradient. So if you come back to this, you come back to this. Uh, most often than not, most often than not, your simulation, yeah, in your undergraduate level, yeah, we all do. So your pressure is one bar. This 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 is one, everything is one bar, somehow. Yeah. So that happens a lot. 
But then since now you know that this doesn't happen at one bar, this doesn't happen at one bar, so this doesn't happen at one bar, so you have to have variations of pressure along the line, yeah, which you could, which you should show in your uh, mass bal uh, stream balance. Okay. Um, so um, that one, and then the mass flow is due to concentration gradients. Yeah, you have this in the uh, in any if you have if you do like this this and column or in liquid construction. So you have to be able to design. Um, you need you need to know uh, where uh, one component is moving from which phase or one which region to what region or to what phase. And the last one is then the heat flows due to temperature gradient. So all of this. So in some cases, for example, so you need to you want to heat it up this from from 25 degrees C and then 250 degrees C and then you have medium pressure steam of five bar, for example. So that doesn't happen, yeah. That doesn't happen, yeah. You can check it. You can you can you can you can check whether I'm speaking the truth or not, yeah. If you have a five bar here or a ten bar here, and then you want to, you hope to increase the temperature here to 250 degrees, that doesn't happen because you don't have enough temperature gradient. So this you have to have it. If you don't have it, you have to have it. Yeah, you go to um, you go to all kinds of you go to Google, you go to patent, you go to um, uh, NIST data bank NIST. You go to your um, uh, simulation software, simulation software, software. Yeah. So you have to have all of this. So you go to uh, like literature, paper. Uh, you have to go, you have to exhaust yourself into all of these um, source of information. You have to get all of this information at your hand before you start designing anything. Okay, so I think I'm finished with the. Um, uh, what are the important uh, 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 points during, uh, yeah, if you want to design all of this, yeah. Um, so some references, uh, why do I don't get the slide, the slide for references. Can keep, it's gone. Uh, my Dropbox is gone. Well, anyhow, oh, okay. I think I don't know if you can see this. It's gone over there. Ah. Can so. Um. What I would like you to go need to go uh, Google Chrome. So you could go to um. Um. Solar Internet. So you have to have this kind of book, yeah, this book, this book, and then you go to um, integrated design and simulation. So you go to uh, this book, uh, or you can go to um, chemical engineering, design and integration. There you go, find this book as well. Um, and then lastly, like a Perry chemical engineering handbook, then then you could you could um, you could you could use it as well. Okay. Um, so these are those are here. I think I lost this because uh, my Dropbox connection was lost. But anyhow, uh, so I think those are the important points um, uh, in general um, in uh, what to yeah what to consider when we are designing any equip uh, designing equipment in your uh, flow sheet. Um, Dr. Muni asked me as well to go to make to make an example. Um, I'm planning to make an example on the reactor here, uh, but I'm not really sure. Um, do you have any questions now? Is there any question, or do you need to? Uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's uh, some, you have to. You have to you have, now you have to um, unmute yourself, and then tell me. Do you need to go? Shall we go to the reactor example, or you have already some questions that need to be discussed now? Because we have only like. If you need to go to sleep or to go to play games at 10 o'clock, so we have less than one an hour to go. One hour to go. So, 
Any question? Or can I see it in the in the Teams? No, I cannot see it in Teams. Is there any question? No questions. Um, no question. Do you get what I mean? Do you? I mean, um, if your report comes to me, yeah, as an external examiner, and then I ask you the same questions that I've just explained to you, can you can you answer them? Yeah, Dr. Monia, I'm I'm not really sure if these people, are, if these students are still uh, at their laptops. Or... We're here. Sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I've 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 talked like uh, close to one hour and there's no question, so it's it's, it's a shame. Can you ask some question? Uh, Sarah, I have a question. Um, test test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, is it um economically efficient if we have a heater or uh -huh. a heat exchanger? Just uh -huh. to change the temperature from something like 18 to 36. Is it practical? I mean, the question should, what we should be asking is that, why do you want to hit that? Why do you want uh, to change the temperature? Oh, because it's uh, to fit the um, optimum operating temperature. Yeah, if you say your 36 degrees C is the required temperature mm -hmm. and you cannot tolerate that anymore, you're, you don't have any... I mean, you cannot escape. Yeah, for example, yeah, for example, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it is it economical for you to buy uh, uh, to buy lunch three ringgits, <coughs> right? I mean, if you want to go through, I'm, I, I, you, we already eat in the morning. I just mm -hmm. want to, I just want to reach at the end of the day. So I want to save these three ringgits, right? So you could uh... ask the same questions. So do you have to? Do you want to spend these three ringgits to buy your lunch, or you could just? I mean, well, it's something that. You could consider I can just fast or I do something else and to make me forget. But if this is mm -hmm. a, a, a real requirement, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you cannot escape here. Yeah? Mm. You, you have to install something. I mean, you have to you have to heat that temperature mm -hmm. uh, from your whatever temperature to that uh, whatever required temperature uh, mm -hmm. by any means necessary. Yeah, by any okay. means necessary. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, sir. And that's all. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Yeah. I would like to know, like, other than AutoCAD, is there any other software that you would rec recommend to design equipment? Um, the, by design here, by design here, I mean draw the equipment, yeah. Yeah, 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 for our PTP too. It's not design, yeah. Um, we don't normally use AutoCAD, yeah. Uh, AutoCAD is the realm of mechanical engineering people. So we limit, I mean, we are happy ourselves with using uh, Visio, simple Visio. You are using, um, uh, how are you using your uh, uh, simulation, yeah? Is it uh, HiSys or Icon Plus or Symmetry? Uh, I use Icon for my... Yeah, so if you, have, if, if you have Icon, for example, I have this uh, Symmetry, Icon, whatever. So mm. it's um, when you put it there and then you <coughs> put your stream and then, the, and, then, and then you can just right click print pfd print pfd and test and then you could get um and you can have your pfd can you see this uh, nice so um there is no need for you to to draw anything else you have the you have the PFD here already. Is that clear? Sir? Yeah. Uh, what about the technical drawing? Is there any software you would like to recommend as others than AutoCAD? Yeah, yeah we mean the interior the structure of the equipment. Um <laughs> so now you um you are you are losing the focus now yeah the the focus for you as a chemical engineer is to design the equipment yeah you design the equipment and you don't really care uh, how it looks like uh, in details that belongs to the mechanical guy okay 
what you need to tell the mechanical people is that the diameter, the length, the thickness of the reactor, and where are the nozzles, and then how big the nozzles are, and then where the nozzles are located, is there any catalyst there, your vessels, uh, how many nozzles do they have, do they have baffles, are they located on the ground, or like 10 meters high, those things, yeah, like also in the exchanges, what you have to communicate with the mechanical guy, and then they will then make a drawing for you, and then they will come back to you with a mechanical drawing. Mechanical drawing. So, you know, I think you don't, you don't need to concern yourself on how to draw this, because this is not, this is not your business. Yeah, we don't do this. This is the mechanical guy. So if you'd like to draw this, I don't know what you want to do. Um, 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 if you would like to draw this, anyhow, yeah, anyway, if you say, so no, so I would just, I want to design this. I want to switch my major to mechanical engineering. I don't know, okay, fine. And then you have to use AutoCAD. That's the only way. Yeah, because Visio, Visio cannot do, um, uh, cannot do like uh, 3D. Uh, kind of drawing uh, it can we can make a like a small model like a maquette uh, model for the plants but it, it it's not that delicate compared to uh, compared to AutoCAD you have to use AutoCAD in that sense but I don't see why you have to design internal of the equipment while you yourself I don't know yeah do you know already how your reactor would look like from the outside I mean, the, what is then the diameter, the, the length, uh, the location, the thickness, the nozzles, where the nozzles are located, how big the nozzles, uh, is there any catalyst? Uh, do you have this already information? And then once you have this and then you still have some time left, oh, and then you can, you can draw your reactor in 3D and um, um, uh, use AutoCAD for that. I don't know, yeah? I mean, maybe now you have time. It's, it's working from home. So, um, I mean, uh, uh, do, do you get my point? Or... Yes. So who asked you to, to, to draw uh, uh, your equipment in 3D? In detail? Is, that, is, the, is this the kind of drawing that you would like to have? This kind of drawing? Yeah. Hello, hello. Hello. Huh? This? Um, so I think because uh, what we have read inside the guideline, it says that um, the requirement, I would say, uh, is stated that we need to draw, um, we need to draw a major equipment, including yeah. the dimensions as well as the thickness, as you mentioned. Yeah. But we are not sure whether we need to specifically draw uh, really detail, as you mentioned. Yep. No. So that so is in that, what we consent. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that means um, yeah. The the issue is not that uh, whether you have to use a software or AutoCAD or whatnot. So the issue is that what you have to clarify is that uh, to how much detail you would like to draw, not how to draw. Uh, not how to draw, but how much detail you need to have. Yeah. If the details, the level of details that you would like to have is only like this uh, diameter, the height the thickness uh, and the nozzles and locations of the nozzles, you could draw it in Visio, which I recommend you to do so. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm. Any other question? Any other question? No more question. I'm not really sure if you understand what I'm saying, yeah? <laughs> but anyhow, I'll just proceed. If you don't have any more questions, I will just proceed with my remaining slides, with my remaining 53 slides. Any other questions before we move on? Hello, hello. I think no, sir. No, okay. No, sir. The, is, is this clear what I've been saying to you? So far, yes, sir. Yes. Do you have yes, enough? Sir. Do you have currently enough information for you to start designing your equipment?
Yes or no? Hmm. Oh, you don't know? I think as for now, no, sir. As for now, no, yeah. I, I know that. So, <laughs> if, if, if you have all the information, that means you are the first batch that I see who has the information. But anyhow. Um, now, let's uh, let's spend the next like half an hour talking about a reactor. Yeah? Let's go to uh, like a simple example. Um, so for each of the uh, for each of the equipment for each of the equipment what you should consider yourself is uh, my pen oh where's my pen pen so for which of this equipment what you should consider yourself is what does it do what does it do so answering this answering this question is very much important uh, 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 than designing it okay so once this is clear so once this is clear and then the, you need to have like i said the operating window of your equipment in this case a reactor so you should ask then ask yourself what is then the type of reaction is it exothermic or endothermic is this releasing heat or uh, 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 con consuming heat and then um, is it like an equilibrium reactions yeah equilibrium reactions or is just like a one-way reactions uh, which is one-way reaction, it's also an equilibrium reaction in a way. And then is it uh, like a homogeneous uh, reaction or heterogeneous reaction? Do you have a catalyst in it, a solid catalyst, for example? Or do you have also a catalyst here, but it's just like a liquid catalyst, for example, Yeah, if you have like liquid-liquid reactions? Um, something that you have to know, something that we have to know. And then your reaction information, how much is then the conversion information that we have? Do you have the selectivity or the yield or the conversion or even better, do you have the kinetic? So if you go, if you get your reactions and then you go to literature, you must, number one, you have to be able to find the uh, kinetics. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have the kinetics, okay, then you can get away with this um, conversion, selectivity and the yield. You can get away with this. Yeah. But please prove that you have the kinetics as um, um, and then, and then, uh, and then, once we get the kinetic, uh, and then we can then design, design or science the the reactor, and then you can get your di the volume first, and you can get your diameter, and then you can get your length. Yeah. So this diameter and length, it has everything to do with your um, uh, residence time. This guy, with your allowable delta p. Okay. Uh, too high delta p, you will you will stuck. Too low delta p, you will not get enough mixing or you not get F enough enough uh, how do you call it wetting of the catalyst. Uh, so uh, so these two will then define your volume and then the length and then the diameter of your reactor. And then the orientations. Are you going to um, put it vertical or horizontal? Yeah, it's um, something that you have to think about. Um, and then if you have a catalyst, how does it look like? Is it like a, like a, a ball like this or something something like this? You have to be able to, or it's like a, like a pallet. Yeah, you have a, a, like a, a cylinder. Yeah, find that catalyst and then Google it, and then you'll get you'll get your uh, a shape. Uh, size and then shape and then porosity and then volume. So this porosity normally you don't have it, but people typically uh, make a make a uh, uh, assumptions um, like a 0.3 or 0.4 or whatnot. And then you can then calculate uh, you can then calculate the volume of your uh, reactor bed. Uh, sorry, catalyst catalyst bed. Okay. Uh, and then for CSTR, what needs to consider is then that you have to make sure that you get the correct power number. Yeah, because a continuous third tank reactor, it's a, it's it's um, it's a third tank reactor. So third tank reactor that means that means it's uh, it deals with liquid. Yeah, it deals with liquid, for example. Yeah, in this case, and then uh, this um, uh, uh, mixer, I think you have you have done you have done lab one, right? Lab one where you where you have to do this um, CSTR lab where you calculated the power number. So people in the lab, uh, when they get when they get the information, so for example, you go to patterns, your reaction has a pattern, and then this pattern says, okay, uh, they have the the size of the uh, the beaker, glass beaker, and then they have the RPM, RPM, uh, and then they have the the size of the impeller, yeah, 
and then you want to translate that into industrial scale you scaling up so you have to make sure the power number here power number is the same as the power number that you would like to have in the industrial scale okay so that's the uh, one of the things to, to consider for for this SCSTR. For the PFR, for the PFR, we have to be able to calculate the pressure drop for the solid catalyst reactions. So it has something to do with this delta P. Okay. So um, it has to be minimum of. I took it from this uh, that integrated design book. Yeah. Um, uh, there is an information for that. Uh, but if you work for a company, they have their own information. So, uh, so it has to be like a, a minimum 0.02 bar per meter of your reactor. Okay, so you have, if you have like one meter here, is it 0.02, and then you have another one meter over there, that is another 0.02, minimum, minimum, yeah. So that means you are, you, you, you are making sure that the flow within this reactor is, is as turbulent as, as it requires, and it wets the catalyst surface so that the reaction can happen. Uh, that's for fixed bed and then the, uh, it's a higher for a trickle bed because trickle it's uh, like the name implies you have this catalyst it just trickle down here so it's a very laminar um, and then um, for fluidized bed reactor fluidized FBD fluid by that what is D for I don't know fluidized bed reactor so make sure that the residence time of your reactor is between the minimum fluidization and the entrainment. So if you, um, because in this fluidizations, you need to have this whole solid into liquid. I mean, behaving like liquid, it has to be fluidized. So that means you have to have a minimum uh, uh, superficial velocity, yeah, to make them uh, 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 suspended as a bed. Uh, but it has to be below. It has to be below the entrainment. So if you increase the uh, superficial velocity in such a way, too high, and this whole bed will then go away. So you don't want that. So this e V here, the 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 V across the, your equipment should be lower than the entrainment. It has to be higher than the uh, minimum um, U. Okay. So um, well. This is one example of tubular reactor. So I took it, uh, this is more like um, uh, um, a polyethylene uh, reactor, tubular polyethylene reactor. So they have uh, polymerization within this tube. Uh, yeah, this is circular, so within this tube. So you can see um, uh, uh, it's, um, so we have this, for example, this is then the ethylene making PE, and we have the outer pipe as the uh, as the cooling medium so um, because it needs a certain uh, uh, residence time and then when they calculate this residence time it uh, it uh, it's a matter not in seconds or milliseconds but in minutes uh, even some minutes and then it's impossible to construct a vertical reactor so rather they remove this so they have a horizontal and then circular uh, reactor like this to save some space yeah um, so that's one example and then a fluidized bed reactor you can see now here uh, so this then the disengagement so we have a fluidized over here so um, so you can see at this part you have a certain uh, superficial velocity at this part you have another v1 this is another v2 where v2 is then much much lower uh, sorry uh, much lower than the v1 because of this and that will then um, destroy the bed. Means the bed, you have the bed over here, it gets up, and then once over here, your uh, superficial velocity here is much lower than the minimum superficial velocity to maintain the bed, so the bed collapses, and then you can then separate the catalyst bed with your gas out. So that's why you see very strange shape over here, and then the, another shape over there. So that's why it, um, yeah, it looks like that. Um, fixed bed reactor. So um, this is in the warehouse. So um, they will they will put it upside down. Yeah, uh, uh, minus 90 degree. Um, so this is then the foundation. The foundation, as you can see, this is the foundation, and then this is then where the um, uh, uh, the start. So they have like another maybe half a meter or one meter. Uh, some distance from the foundations to the um, to the reactor bed, and inside of this maybe they have the bed, 
and they have a number of nozzles. So maybe some nozzles is to uh, this for manhole, manhole, and this is maybe then the nozzle of your. Uh, here we don't know where the feed is coming from. Uh, say for example, it's coming from the. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I assume somewhere it's coming from the bottom. For example, I don't know which is the no which one is the nozzle. Maybe this one, the bigger one, and then it goes up. Assuming this is coming here and it goes up there. Okay, and then you have a main hole over here, and then you have maybe a side glass over here, and you have some uh, nozzles here, nozzle there, another so many nozzles. This is normally for temperature, temperature for the thermocouple, for the temperature measurements. This is also from the temperature measurements or pressure measurements if necessary. Yeah, so you have so many nozzles. So all of these nozzles. Um, uh, you have to show it in your in your reactor drawing, yeah, which you just asked. Um, so main hole, uh, in and out nozzles, and then the nozzles for temperature and pressure readings, and then also nozzles for uh, if you want to change your catalyst, for example. Uh, normally we have another 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 main hole over here, not main hole, to pour your catalyst into the into the um, into the um, into the reactor. Yeah, maybe this is then your catalyst hole, or maybe you could also put your catalyst through this hole. Yeah, whatever you want. Uh, as long as as long as it is clear, and then you can show it uh, to your um, supervisor um, uh, where you're going to put uh, or take out your catalyst to take in, put in, and taking out your catalyst. Um, batch reactor. If you go to uh, like a milk plant or dairy plant or um, yeah, pharmaceutical plant or food industries, you would see this very clean. Um, room, yeah, very clean. Um, this is a batch reactor, so they put, for example, I've been into a Ben and Jerry ice cream uh, plant, so they put uh, milk, uh, like uh, some um, bags of um, 50 kilograms. They put the milk in, and then they put like a sugar in, and then they put uh, um, like what was they put here? Yeah? Um, I don't know what else they put. Yeah. So once they put all of the ingredients, they close this, they close this, and then they um, they begin heating, and then they begin stirring. And then once this is done, yeah, after some time, for example, and then they just um, uh, empty this vessel. So um, empty this normally in the in the this is the second level. So you have underneath it, you have the first level, and then here you can have the um, uh, the nozzle out, so they can you open the valve, and they can empty this vessel. And then clean it, and then put the new batch of ice cream again. Um, this is another uh, yeah batch reactor. Yeah, it doesn't include the second and the first floor like this. So it's all in the first floor. So this is then the uh, the the nozzle out, and then you have so many nozzles in uh, at the top. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, you have a CSTR reactor. CST reactor, continuous third tank reactor, continuous third tank reactor. So it's basically the same as like a batch reactor, but it's just we have a continuous in, continuous in, and then you have continuous out, and then this is U, for example. So um, this we have inside of the reactor, we have this uh, blade, and then there's another blade, there's another blade. Then you could ask yourself why this blade looks different from that blade. Yeah, for this you have to find the answer back in lab one. Okay, when you do this CSTR reactor, if you forget about that, then go back reading it. Okay, so um, so this guy is in the reactor to make sure that all this mixer is clean. There is no um, uh, impurities whatsoever. There's no dirt or whatnot, and uh, so that means it has to have. That means you have to be able to open this uh, so that this guy can come in, or you have to have like this this, this main hole, for example, it has to be big enough for a guy. A guy to to get inside there. Okay, so uh, one of the um, uh, most famous or infamous CSTR reactor is the six CSTR six CSTR reactor in Flixboro and Flixboro accident. Yeah, Flixboro. So F L I, not F I L. So you can Google this Flixboro incident. There are six six CSTR in series. So each reactor, so I think one, uh, one, two, or oh, maybe from here, one, two, three, uh, four, the, the exploded one, and then five, the exploded one, I don't remember which is the fourth one or the fifth one, and then another one, six. So six CSTR reactor um, um, exploded. So each reactor only has 
six, yeah, very coincidence here. Conversion, six percent. So the conversions, if I'm, if if I can still remember it correctly, the conversions per reactor is only six percent. So six percent here, six percent there, six percent here, six percent there. So in 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 the end, you have like a um, total of thirty-six percent conversions, and you have seventy uh, sixty-four unreacted which you will then recycle back so you can imagine so 64 is a huge number yeah, compared to this 36 so 64 is more than half so he, it's a huge recycle so it means that means this this line connecting all of these reactors as well as the reactors is a very big line so this line very big line uh, it contains a very very high of those um, components which if you have any leak whatsoever, it will create vapor and it will then go kaboom. Like this. Okay. Um, what time is it now? Okay. I think you have seen this. Um, say for example, yeah, you have uh, you have two computing reactions, uh, A and B, A1 or A2. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if you have already the information on so kinetic, but if you do have them, and then you can come back to this book uh, that I think in the in the in the chemical process design and integration book you can find this same picture, which is copy paste. It's uh, chapter four, figure four point six. Um, so you can have like a, it shows you like a, the mix flow, CSTR basically, and you have a batch reactor and you have a fig, uh, plug uh, PFR reactor. So if you have uh, A1 is then your fit, uh, A2 is another fit. So if A1, um, 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 if A1, uh, sorry, if, if A2 is bigger than A1, so that means you want to uh, minimize this reaction two, right? So reaction two is your, um, in this case, the uh, unwanted reactions. So you want to minimize it, so that means you need to make sure that this A1 minus A2 as small as possible, and then this K2 over K1 as small as possible. Yeah. So um, by doing so, you could you could you could argue, okay, I want to make uh, minimize this, so you could then put them all together. Yeah, because uh, there is no way um, uh, if 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 this A2 is bigger than A1, there is no way that you could then overcome this A2. So uh, just just dump them all together but if your intended reaction is your intended reactions is bigger than your unwanted reactions and then you can you can fit this so you have a, you have a batch reactor yeah you put a1 here uh, and then a2 there but then your since your a1 is then bigger than a2 so in the end you will get more a1 uh, reactor reaction compared to a2 in fact and batch or you can also fit it there so you have you have you have um, this plug flow, which in a sense it will behave like this batch. So this batch, uh, for, say for example, I want to limit these reactions in such a way that my A2 maximum maximum A2 is such and such such a number. So based on this number, you can you can go back to this reactor and then you can calculate what is the residence time. So from this residence time, you can calculate the uh, the size of the uh, reactor with the same residence time. Because you have the flow rate, you can also calculate the length of the reactor. Okay. So now here you have, uh, in this case, you have uh, feed one and feed two, which you can, you could, you could, you could have the same argument, uh, feed one, feed two. So for example, um, you have, um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's it's uh, 21, 41. So uh, if B two is bigger than B one. And then uh, you would want to um, uh, minimize this, yeah. So you want to suppress this reactor two, but you have B two bigger than B one, so that means this guy is a positive number. Uh, sorry, this is a positive number, so this is bigger than one, okay? So this is bigger than one, and then the same way, okay? Uh, so in this case, just the same argument over here. So I cannot do anything with this B two whatsoever, so I can just go to the mixed flow. See what happens, and but if your intended reaction is much bigger or bigger than your unwanted reactions, then you can do the same argument over here. So you either make a, a batch or semi batch, yeah. So you have uh, um, the fit to the B, 
and then the, and then you feed one uh, intermittently just uh, enough to make sure that you don't produce the unwanted reaction um, uh, in a in a bigger amount um, this is also another um, uh, uh, configuration that you can see and read for yourself. I just put it here so that you can you can you can you know that you have seen it and you can come back anytime. So um, this is about the um, temperature. So it will be related to your temperature control later on. Um, so what can I tell? So for example. So this is then your temperature. So the higher the temperature, and then this in this case, the higher your conversions. You have this. Um, in this case, you can see that uh, the higher the temperature, the higher the conversions, uh, and then this one is then the lower the temperature, the higher the conversions. So you could think which one is then ex exothermic, which one is then endothermic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Think, uh, Okay, <laughs> um, so in this case, um, so you have here in uh, for the same for the same curve here, you have like interstage cooling. Interstage cooling means um, you in, um, you re release heat, you release heat, yeah, and then your temperature goes up, yeah, from the minimum or the entering to the maximum. So the next minimum is you cannot go above it. So that means you limit the uh, your reactor size in such a way that you produce enough Q for your exothermic reactions so that the temperature here, temperature doesn't go beyond the maximum. And then you take it out and then you cool it down. And then you let it react again, temperature goes up, and then you cool it down again. And then it goes up and then you cool it down again. So that's how you come up with this, this stage. Um, the same way is you, um, the same way like this one. Um, so it's also a kind of uh, reactor temperature control, sorry. So uh, some of the reactor goes here and it will then be react. It gets um, uh, at a higher temperature over there, but then it will then be quenched by uh, a fresh and cold incoming another feed. So temperature will drop and then it will enter the second bed and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it's uh, more like a zigzag over here. And then in this case, uh, you have a reactant. And then the heat is then removed by um, by yeah producing steam. So in this case, um, the temperature here you could say it remains constant as in the case here. Uh, so it remains constant as in the um, which depends on the pressure of the steam that you would like to um, produce over there. And this is for the that uh, CSTR reactor. So you have either heating and cooling to control the temperature in the in, in the reactor. Uh, by by coil, for example, or by uh, jacket heating, or by uh, you take it out um, um, some parts and then you split it and then you um, cool and some parts and then you put it back in. So you have you make sure that temperature here stays the same like in this the other three. Uh, the same way goes up here. So if you have if you produce if you produce a vapor, so you get that vapor, yeah. So in order not to make the pressure here too high, you get that paper out and then you cool it down, condense it and then put it back into the reactor. So that's another way of, of uh, controlling the temperature in the reactor. So um, that's another stuff, uh, 46, uh, that's another stuff. So for example, uh, we have a gas liquid reactor. So uh, for in the ideal case, in the ideal case, you have a batch and you have uh, PFR you have a CSTR. Yeah, what makes this very different is that this is you have a mix or what we call back mixing. So the product, what we call back mixing is then the product will then be mixed yeah, because it's coming here and then it mix. So once this product, uh, once this, this reactant gets into this vessel, so the concentration here, we assume homogeneous. So the concentration here is the same as the concentration over there. So that's what we call back mixing. Yeah. So it's everything is just mixed like hell. Uh, but the PFR, PFR is that um, the there is no there is no back mixing, no back mixing, no back mixing. So that means once it enters here, it goes there and it doesn't go back. Yeah. This is not happening. So it goes up. Yeah, so it goes to the right. So there is no back mixing, uh, but there is only one mixing to the uh, uh, axial. 
Uh, so the concentration over here is the same, but this concentration here is different than the concentration over there is different than concentration over here. So for example, the uh, uh, raw material concentrations over here is the highest, and then the, at this point in time, the CA is uh, getting to zero. So that's what we mean by the PFR, but by the batch is um, uh, it is time, yeah. So concentrations and this time, so it goes like that. Okay. So you can stop the reaction here or there or there, uh, up to you. And then you can size the reactor accordingly. So if you come back here, if you can see now here, so we have the gas coming in and then the gas going out and then liquid going in and liquid going out. And then in between, this gas, it doesn't go back here. It just it doesn't go back. It's just going in that direction. This liquid is going in that direction. So the only thing that goes in one direction is the PFR, right? So hence we call this this one PFR. That's another PFR. So um, uh, so um, yeah, this one PFR and that's another PFR. So if uh, this ideal, if we translate it to the practical knowledge, so we have gas coming in and then gas going out. So one way. It's not two ways. So it doesn't it doesn't hang out here. It doesn't hang out over there. Or it doesn't go back. It this doesn't happen. So you have to make sure that the gas flow upwards. How do you do so? You have to make sure the pressure drop. And the same situation with the liquid. Yeah. So you have to make sure that this liquid, uh, the, the, the ratio between gas and liquid in such a way that your liquid will not be in trend. There won't be any liquid going up. No liquid going up, all liquid going down. And then no gas going down. Yeah, Because there is a, if you have a, like a lower amount of gas the gas can go down but you don't want to that, that don't, you don't want that to happen so please make sure that this ra this ratio is uh, at a certain number um, that's concurrent but this is also a co-current pfr co-current pfr this is then how you translate into practice um, uh, this one yeah interesting so you, now you have a cstr you want to have a CSTR gas, yeah, mixing. So this gas can go here, can go there, can go there, can go there, and can come back here and can go back there. So it's all CSTR gas, but you have a PFR liquid. So your CSTR gas is like this. So you have liquid uh, droplet, yeah. So because this liquid droplet it will just fall by gravity there. And this gas, this gas can just go here and there, here and there. So it has back mixing of the gas, yeah. And then until it goes there, so it is not necessary that the gas will then flow there. Yes, you can do so. Just in this case of the reactor, so one part can just go straight into this line, and some part gets gets here stuck, and then do some reactions. And it has, if you if you have this um, uh, resonance time uh, distribution, so this is distribution. So your residence time distribution will be something like this. What you would like to have is obviously one line, but this is what you have in CSTR. Okay, um, nine more minutes. Um, this I can leave this to your own imagination on how to translate this into that and this into that. Um, the same goes with the liquid liquid reactor. If you have any, um, this is the. Uh, um, I don't know if you have heard anything called like a moving bed reactor. So it's not it's not a fixed bed, not a fixed bed. It's not a um, fluidized bed like this, uh, but it's a moving bed. So the catalyst comes here, and then it will then sorry here, and then it will then uh, um, get in touch with the feed and hydrogen. We'll get in touch with the catalyst, and it goes make some reactions. And we get the product coming out, and then this catalyst is then going down, and then um, some of the catalysts we take it out because they are deactivated, deactivated, or they are yeah like eroded, yeah, and then um, uh, we put a new catalyst in, we put a new catalyst in as well, yeah. Some we recycle, some we put a new catalyst in. Oh, we have the catalyst in here. I'm oh, sorry, so we don't need to have this. Uh, in the fluidized bed reactor, like I said, uh, see this is where the area where you um, kill the uh, uh, the bed, 
So where you have uh, gas, gas and solid depressions in this area help with the cyclones. Uh, and then this bed is more like, um, uh, how do you call it, um, a bubbling bed, so to say. Um, and then this is then the lift media. So you have the fit. This is what we call a riser. So this is like a fast uh, circulating fluidized bed. So um, it's, it's uh, normally in the range of one to two seconds. And then so we have here and there. Uh, the liquid and sorry the catalyst and the product product goes up catalyst drops over here so uh, from here to there the density of the uh, uh, bed is getting increases so here you have a hydrostatic uh, not hydrostatic but um, it's like um, um, higher static pressure here compared to there so hence it can flow here sorry it can flow here right and it goes up help with this air so there are normally also some many um, fluidizing medium to get this whole things mambo jumbo and then it goes back here yeah um, okay so seven more minutes I'm not really sure if I have to go here but um, just to give you um, uh, an idea yeah I'll spend like one minute each so suppose that we have these uh, reactions, you have to have it, you have to find it. Uh, so you have all of this uh, um, K, 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 um, and then you can play around here. So these are all the kinetic equations that you need to develop, and then you make a uh, kind of in this, I make it in, in Excel. So this is then the product A, sorry. Um, so A, A and B is then the raw material, C is then the product that we would like to have. Um, B can react to make E, the waste, or waste and then d is then the byproduct that we don't want uh, because we let the c too long in the reactor so make the equations so we plot it see what happens so it is then the base case so now you plot the concentrations of a a is then the blue line so this is then a it starts from one for example you can start from whatever you want and goes down so you can see that the a is then going down so if I simulate this until 100 seconds, uh, this then the CA at the 100 seconds. So you can go even further. Yeah. Um, this is then the concentrations of B. Start from here. You could start also from there. It's up to you. And then the green one is then the main product, main product that we would like to have. And then this, um, uh, I don't know what color this is. This is the D. And then this is then the blue one is then the uh, E. So D and E, we don't want them. What we want to have is the green one, the, the, the C. So um, I have a question here. How do you get 35 seconds? So I designed the reactor for 35 seconds. Uh, something that you can figure out yourself. Yeah. Why is 35 seconds? It's simply because if we look at this, I want to maximize C, right? So this is C is our product. So I want to maximize C. So it's somewhere here in this region. So it's 30, 35. You could also, well, I don't want to make it 30 or 25. Whatever or 35 yeah somewhere here in this region so it's it's up to you uh how many uh, so then um if if you have already down to the 35 seconds you can get um you know the you, know, you have you have the capacity and you have the density and then the you can then calculate So you mute it. Uh, I think we can't hear you. So we cannot hear you. So I think we can't hear you. No? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Has yes, it, yes. Has it, is this just like a few seconds or has it gone for the last half an hour? No, no, just a few seconds. Yes, no, just, no, just a few seconds. seconds. seconds sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do not know what I did. I mean, okay. Anyhow, um, so three more seconds. Uh, three more seconds. <laughs> three more minutes. Um, so I uh, just play around here. So what happens if I added a B? So remember that we have um, we have this kind of. Thing. So if I because A is then one reactor, one reactant. Sorry, B is then another reactant. So I just want to increase B to get this high. I increase this right from one and half. I want to make it one and one. See what happens. And then the, um, 
uh, sorry not uh, uh, so if sorry i did not increase b but i just when 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 b is then dropping to 0.1 for example i add another b so i add it there and then the, and then the direction continues and then until 0.1 so why do you think this curve is steeper than this curve that is because well i think you can answer that that is because that the concentrations of a is also reducing yeah, it's not the same as in this profile here a is that high but in this case um, yeah a is much lower compared to um, b previously so we have much more like um, yeah not that steep compared to here so if we do this we, if we add, keep adding b uh, while with the same amount of a and then the the productions of c can increase like this yeah so that's one option to get to more c but in this case you could see that the other de de they are also um uh, increasing and then you could play around so i here i can play around so with b yeah and then i can see okay c is then mo uh, moving upwards and then the, um, what if then i i keep the option two so i keep adding this uh, B is then adding regularly and then I remove C. So every time C is re uh, because C, you see that C, this, this C, once it gets produced, it will then react to D. But then D, once D produces, then it gets reacts to C. But then in order to minimize D, I say that, okay, once C is then uh, produced, I take that out. So in this case, maybe then I can combine one reactor with another separation unit, for example, membrane reactor, or distillation, uh, ex uh, reactive distillation column, things like that. So in a way that to remove C continuously. So in this case, what happens is that we get we get this kind of profile, which you can calculate yourself. Yeah, is this beneficial? Mm, we don't know, we have to check. So in this, uh, lastly, and that's another option as well. So we increase the concentrations of A, limited concentration of B. Why we limit the concentration of B? because if you go back to directions b is then producing e right and this e is just waste but if you have uh, so that means we have to limit b yeah but this a even though a will then react with c to make d but then d can go back to c and a so in the last option i say okay so i get d but then i uh, uh, i put another uh, separations over here so I get C, I get E, and then I recycle back the uh, D to make A and then C over here. So in the end, this could be your options of, of designing a reactor. So I was um, I was about to show you, uh, um, it's 10 o'clock, so I'm about to show you how to do this simple calculations in symmetry. I don't know if you are okay with that. It's all up to you. If you say that we are done here, 10 o'clock, done. And then I'm happy if you say that you would like to see how this is done, this exercise done in symmetry or in your icon, and then uh, let me know, yeah. So um, thank you. If you have any questions, yeah, I don't know. So we stop here, or you have some questions, or you would like to go to see how this is uh, done, this exercise is done in symmetry. It's all up to you. You can your you can raise your voice. Yeah, I think that yeah, we should get some question from the stu uh, yeah, student. Okay. okay. I think we should continue. With now this session is open for question and answer. As I told you, this is a good opportunity to know many things about the yeah. Yeah, in this yeah, reactor. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, particularly today, the Dr. Jutman discussed about the reactor design. So I think the 50 percent student, and you are going to design the, the reactor as a major equipment. So you can ask any question. Any question? Oh, you are all sleeping already. Yeah, yeah. Could you please speak louder, louder? Uh, I would like to ask if the nozzle, right, uh, the velocity, is it important for that? Because uh, they have their nozzle velocity that they can break down the, I mean, the flange and all those. The nozzle yeah, velocity, yeah. Is that is that a concern for the process? 
well, you know it is a concern. That's, that's why you ask these questions, you know. So if, yeah, uh, uh, on, if you on know the that this is a concern, on, do it. Yeah. On what, uh, what are the standards that we have to apply on or uh, uh, for the... Yeah. Uh, typically, you could you could just Google this yourself. But typically, typically, what we see is then for nozzle, it's a row V square should be lower than two thousand two hundred. Yeah, this is an SI unit. So um, this is what we at this early stage. This is what we do. So you know when you when you have this nozzle incoming. Um, so this is then the nozzle. So you know the 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 density here, and then you know the velocity, right? Because you design the line, and then the, um, uh, if you calculate that the row v square is bigger than 2200 yeah uh, i don't remember yeah i mean this number it's 2200 or 2000 or in some other cases it's because it's different from liquid to vapor so it's something that you can google yourself so um so in in some cases not well, in some cases in many cases what you would see is then if this is then the vessel so say say for example you have now two inch line and then this nozzle you would see then they are increasing in size uh, if you go to if you go to your plant, so this is two inch and then this could be like a three inch for example. So this guy is coming from this calculation. So it's just to minimize vibrations. Uh, well, minimize vibration is number one. So if you have if you have this information and then you would like to do so, that's a plus point. Yeah, I would say. Right, thank you. Thank you. Mm. So I may want to ask, uh, may I know what, what are the requirements, uh, I mean the sizing to be found uh, for the reactor? Uh, the, si the required sizing yeah, is for, for example, uh, we need uh, to find volume, uh, area, length, pressure, or material selection, thickness, height in order to find the uh, reactor costing, or do I miss out any uh, particular uh, requirements? Well, in the end, in the end, I think I've shown you the reactor science. Ah, I forget the thing. So, um, so the minimum reactor configurations. I think, uh, yeah, we have just to conclude, yeah, to conclude on this part. Uh, so you know the operating conditions, and it means you need to know you size it. That means you know, you know the volume, and then you you know the diameter, you know the length. So this diameter and length, the diameter is especially important for the footprint. Uh, where's mine? So for the footprint of your, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, this part. So we need this. So you need to go to your uh, mechanical guy, mechanical friend, and the civil guy. This they will uh, make the foundation for you, foundation, and then this will find for you. Yeah, they will find for you. This guy. So um, and then you need to know also the thickness. So thickness. Um, because you need to inform this mechanical guy, um, and then the, um, whether you have catalyst or not, and then if you then size the, for example, this is then your uh, uh, tangential uh, reactor, yeah. So this is then the, your head. This is design yourself. Uh, so for example, uh, if um, your reaction happens only in the re react uh, sorry happens only in the catalyst bed and then you calculate your catalyst volume and it happens to be yeah this is then your catalyst volume for example for example and then um, you could extend this a little bit yeah extend this a little bit and extend this a little bit put that there and put it there and then this is then your catalyst bed so that means you know the length and then the diameter and then you know how much is then the catalyst in it in kilogram because you're going to buy this later on this will be included in the into your uh, economic calculation um, and then the, um, once you get your catalyst kilogram and then is your reaction exothermic or endothermic so you need to either remove the heat or add the heat so now you have to think about how do I add or remove the heat do I have to put the jacket here if I put the jacket over here, yes, the temperature here can be controlled. But what if what happens to the temperature over here? That means if you um, you can calculate you can calculate the temperature here by heat conduction. Yeah, you can uh, approximate that with the heat conduction. 
uh, if the temperature here is um, assumed that as the same as the temperature here or slightly lower, and then you can then calculate the temperature in in the in in in, in the middle. So if the temperature here in the middle is too low because you have a too big of a diameter here, so you can better then squeeze your reactor, make your reactor a bit smaller, uh, and then then you can control your uh, temperature here. It's a bit it's a bit more uniform. Or you can do you can do with uh, with um, um, uh, this kind of um, temperature control. Right? This kind of temperature control. Um, and then the last thing is then the nozzle because here you can have you have for example you have you have uh, nozzles for the reactant, nozzles for the product, and then nozzles for the um, uh, heating or cooling medium. Uh, so I mean, if you have four nozzles already, and then you may need to have a nozzles for pressure, for example, and you need to have like a temperature, for example, and then this temperature you may need to have like a, I don't know maybe you, you want to surround this for temperature to make sure that the temperature here at the same level is the same. Yeah, this you can decide yourself. Yeah, you just want to have like one or two or three. It's up to you. But at least uh, what what I would like to see is then the nozzle for the reactor. You need to know how the reactant gets into the reactor how the product gets out of the reactor, is there any um, heating or cooling medium, and then how do they get into the reactor. So we have four nozzles at least, and then the temperature nozzles, and then the pressure nozzles, and then if this reactor is big, for example, say it's like a one meter, so you need to have like a handhold. So if it's like a, a five, six meters, or maybe four meters, uh, or three meters, and then you need to inspect it, you need to inspect into the into the reactor, so you need to have like a, a manhole, so that's another nozzles that you can think of. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I think it's for for as as a minimum requirement, you should have this those kinds of of, of nozzles. Any other questions? That's operating conditions, length, diameter, volume, thickness, um, catalyst in kilograms, uh, heat removal additions, and then the nozzles. So these are one, two, three, four, five five important points uh, uh, we have to be able to see that in in your uh, process that the sheet of your reactor yeah this whole information should be there anything else any other questions hello hello Hello, hello, hello. No more for now. No, no more questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, 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 sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment. I do this in Excel, but you could also, uh, since you have symmetry, uh, you could, you could do so. You could do your uh, in symmetry like, like what, I, what I did now. Here, for example, um, um, I have um, uh, toluene, toluene hydrogen, and then the temperature here should not be. Uh, higher than 700 degrees C, for example, for safety reason. Uh, in this case, if I have like a, a five meters length, I ended up having 275 degrees C, which is not allowed. But in this case, um, a benzene, benzene is then the main product, main product, and then this then biphenyl is then the side product, which I don't want. So you can see the production of benzene and diphenyl, uh, and this is also not allowed. So instead of having one meters, uh, one reactor with five meters in length, uh, I split them into two reactors, so uh, 35 centimeters. Uh, why I stop at 35 centimeters? Why not 36 centimeters? Because then the temperature will go above 70 degrees, uh, 700 degrees C. So that's how I limit this number. So, um, and then uh, I cool it down to uh, uh, yeah the same temperature as in here, and then um, put it back again to the remaining yeah if this is 35 centimeters, this is then four meters, uh, 65 centimeters. And then uh, to maximize, I mean, to get to the same length here. So in this case, I still end up with, um, uh, yeah, I end up with a, a lower temperature. So I'm okay in this safety concern. And then you can see now I am producing more benzene, see, 98 compared to 86, and then um, uh, less biphenyl compared to 13 compared to 19 so in this case you could argue so i have you have you have we have two design design options so you have delta of benzene is about um, 12 kilomole per hour and which you can 
have an additional um, you can sell and then that number is then you can then distribute to this um, the investment because you need to have more space for two reactors and then the more space more 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 capex for yeah for foundations of this or foundations of that and then to buy uh, another cooler so the capex of this guy should be overcome with the additional number here yeah so this is something that you can you can calculate roughly there's no need to be accurate um, at least you can you can have an idea on why you select this uh, rather than this or the other way around why you select this rather than that one so it's uh, just an option um, so thank you if there's no any questions um, yeah, I don't know if there's any question left or if not then yeah Dr. it's up to you okay so thank you thank you Dr. Zulfan for your yeah nice presentation and I think that it will be certainly helpful for the student to design the major equipment. Thank you. So since they already know that your email address, yeah, I asked the student if they have any additional question. Is it okay to contact with you? Mm, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. But don't expect me to um, uh, answer that right away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, so I understand. Mm. So if anything is related to that today presentation, yeah. they will contact with you. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Julfan. Yeah. I, um, could you later uh, share the recording with me? Eh? Okay, okay, understand. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Zulfan. you. Okay, thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Bye -bye. okay. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. So, All thank students you. are asked to the uh, login you, in the you learn and and fill the you, fill the survey that will count as a attendance and important thing that i found the only 150 student attend the, this session so please ask you the uh, your group members who have sent the yeah, this will be reflecting the C factor. So, uh, I hope the uh, <laughs> next uh, adjunct lecture all students will be here. Uh, okay, uh, please fill the survey form in your learn system. Do you have any question? You can ask me. If anything, you can ask me. So I would like